ahead and turn this over to Connie so she can kind of lead us through some insights that she has to share. So Connie, up on your screen, there'll be a, on your top of your right, there'll, uh, there'll be a, an unmute button so that you can uh, talk out loud. There we go. Okay. All right, I'm, um, I'm Connie McLeod and I'm, uh, I'm a little nervous, so give me a second. But um, my spiritual name is Slew Pikel, Cedar Moon Woman. I am a Pelp Tribal member. I have worked for the Pelp Tribe for greater than 40 years. I was actually 20 when I started here and I'll be 68 in a couple of months. I've been here that entire time, minus 18 months of unemployment or not employed. I was employed someplace else, but um, I am a member of the Pialp tribe. My father was a Pialp tribal member. My grandfather was a Pialp tribal member and um, that's where my father enrolled myself and a sister and three brothers. I have um, also, uh, my mother is Chehalis, which is just south of Olympia. And we have continued ties there. My great grandmother, was Alice Kitsap. Alice Kitsap mm -hmm. was the daughter of Chief Kitsap. Mm -hmm. And Keith, Keith, Chief Kitsap lived here in the Puyallup Valley. And also then after the Indian <laughs> Wars, after the treaty, he um, went to live towards Suquamish. I have one sister and three brothers. I have two daughters and a son. I have, like I said, I have uh, worked for the Pialp tribe since the time, or since um, I was 20. My very first job was as a um, demographic surveyor, which gave us gave the Pialp tribe information to uh, continue with a lot of its development. I um, live, um, I live towards the um, Nisqually Indian Reservation. When I was very young, the Nisqually Reservation didn't have but a few families living on the reservation. It wasn't, there was no federal dollars coming in at that time for housing. My father was an army veteran. He was able to purchase a home and my family still has that property just outside of Yellum and close to Fort Lewis there on Highway 510. My grandfather was, my grandmother was Nisqually and that's where I was raised. And like I said, my family home, I still have a family home there. My brother lives there. I um, went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico my junior, senior year of school, one year postgraduate um, and attended the College of Santa Fe, returning home after my father passed away. And I attended uh, Tacoma Community College, eventually graduating from there and then was employed at the Pialp Tribe. Today, I, um, 
Today, I am the culture director for the Piel tribe. I've been the culture director for about 15 years. I had been at the Piel Tribal Health Authority where I had attended a training and there was a, um, a session on Native Americans. And I saw the word culture coordinator and we did a lot of work we about uh, uh, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity. And I brought the idea back to the Help Tribal Health Authority to develop a position as a cultural coordinator. And eventually I wrote the job and I got the job. And I did that for almost 10 years at the Piel Tribal Health Authority. And they're introduced Native American traditional medicine, uh, cultural programs to increase the awareness of cultural, uh, particularly Native American issues to the staff that provided healthcare to our community. And then I, at one time, um, 1978, ran for tribal council and I was elected and I've served a three year plus one year term on the Piel Tribal Council. And at that time was involved with the Piel Tribes land claim settlement and, uh, <clears throat> and participated in those discussions. Following that time, I returned to um, working for the tribe and the uh, Piel Tribal Health Authority. A few years back, I moved the program from the Piel Tribal Health Authority. And now the cultural department is under the supervision of the Piel Tribe. And our program has grown and developed um, quite widely. So it's a little bit about myself, a little bit about um, some of the positions that I've held over the last 40 years. And at this time, I'd like to talk a little bit about what life was like as was shared with me before treaty time. Those of us that live in the Northwest are aware of the beauty and the bounty of our natural environment. Our people lived in connection with that natural environment, learning from and determining activities by the seasons and by development that, that nature showed them. Our people lived along the waterways. We were largely canoe people. That the waterways were our, were our roads. That's how we traveled. Our people would cut down a cedar tree, bring it to the water and move it by the water to our home area, our village. And that's where they would carve great canoes. All of the cedar tree is used from the material used to carve a canoe. All of the bark would have been used for clothing, for baskets, for cushioning, for things that were used in daily life. The cedar tree also was used for our housing. We lived in long houses with five, six uh, family units. Our long houses were, were, were made from cedar. The cedar tree can live to be 1200 years old. We had great cedar trees, pre-European contact. Our cedar, our cedar homes would, would be built and would stand 
for multiple generations. The, the cedar does not rot. It is resistant to rain. So there was, that is how our homes were able to stay standing for a very, very long time. Our people lived with a great abundance. We didn't have to go far to look for our food. We lived along the waterways. Salmon was an abundance. There are stories that said you could walk across the streams on the backs of the salmon when they were migrating upriver. We had clams, we had crab, we had many, many food products that came from the water. Our people could hunt deer. We would gather in the springtime. It is almost now time to gather camas. I am in my office in Tacoma on the Piaup Reservation, but I live in Graham. So every day I drive in and there are several patches where the camas is still growing. And so I'm watching for the flowers to bloom so that we can gather camas. And camas grew in what used to be very, very vast areas of prairie, prairie between Tacoma and Vancouver. And with the kinds of logging practices um, that there are now, we lost a great amount of our prairies. We used to preserve our prairies by, do, by doing an annual burning to burn off the underbrush and keep our prairies, prairies nourished. And so today was settlement and the lack of those natural areas, there are fewer and fewer areas where the camas continues to grow. And so this is, this is a time that we would begin to gather camas. This is also the time where the dogwood is blooming. And then again, I said, this is how we, we watch nature and nature would tell us what time it was. And so when the dogwoods bloom, it's also the time where we can gather uh, and pull the cedar bark. Um, and so we are about ready to go gather cedar bark next Saturday. <clears throat> and so we watch those for those kind. Those are the kinds of things that were taught down to the generations that you also harvest ethically. You don't over harvest the cedar tree. We wouldn't strip the entire um, bark off the entire tree because you would kill the tree. Gathering har gathering camas, um, the the you dig the root out of the ground. It's a small bulb. We eat the bulb as food, but it is that a gathering practice that um, actually aerates the area and allows it to continue to redevelop and grow back even greater when it's attended to in that manner. But it, so we had great food resources to, near us um, from the water, from the land. And so we lived in, in a very moderate weather. Also, our winters are not severe. We don't have a lot of uh, snow and freezing cold. We didn't, we have a moderate weather. We didn't have to worry about um, how we were going to house ourselves because we lived in, a long, in long houses that stood um, fairly permanently. So our food resources were close by and abundant. Our housing was more than adequate. So by the time winter came, we would have spent the spring and summer gathering, it would have been a time of travel. 
would have been a time of socializing with our potlatches. And <clears throat> when winter came, it gave us a time to be able to um, make our baskets, to carve our canoes, to do our carvings for our house bowls, to do our weaving. We didn't have to spend the entire winter hunting and gathering food. We had time to become expert weavers, expert carvers. This also was a time of storytelling, was a time of sharing with our households, our history, our stories, teaching the values of our people to our children and to continue with that kind of entertainment. But it allowed for our people to have that time to specialize and become experts and to teach. And then by springtime again, they would prepare and get ready to begin gathering their foods, gathering their materials for baskets, for weaving. And then they would be able to travel further by canoe. We had, we had people who were um, traders and they would, when they got ready to, to leave, they would be gone for years, three, four, five years, traveling great distances. Our canoes were built in such a manner that they were, there were ocean going canoes. We traveled up and down the coast as far as Alaska into California and probably further south. But also there are stories that our people traveled across the Pacific Ocean and were very much aware of the um, Polynesian Hawaiian cultures. They also traveled here. And in one of our families, uh, from Nisqually, we have a Peter Kalama family, and he came across in the mid 1800s um, on a Hawaiian ship that uh, came here to the Washington coast, and he married here. And so there were were South Pacific and Asian um, travelers in our territories for many many years before that. Our people then were able to um, live with great abundance. They also shared with great abundance. Our people's uh, wealth was measured by not how much they owned, but how much they were able to give away, what they shared. When we shared that the our people lived in a longhouse and there was five, six, um, extended families in that house, there may be a, a head, what would be considered today a chief or at least a leader of that house. That leader would be a leader by his ability to take care of everyone in the family, everybody in that household. Nobody went without. Everybody understood that responsibility of taking care of each other. So his wealth was shared not only with his, the um, families that lived in his house, they would have been families by blood with, and also by extended relationship. People who needed someplace to be, they would take families in, they would take individuals in. We also had a history of taking slaves. So we would have people who were also from maybe other areas, but they were also well taken care of. You, you were not rich by what you had, you were rich by what you were able to give. So our travelers, our traders, they were able to trade extensively. And when they brought their wealth home, they would have a potlatch. They would have a potlatch for um, a marriage, a death, for a name, for a special event in that village. And everything, 
everything would be given away. Everything would, would um, be given to those people that were invited. That chief would have, would have sent runners to other villages and they give um, a cedar um, stick to the village leader and, and the sticks say, how many of your people will come? And if they said 25 people would come from my village, that, then that way the chief would know there's 25 people coming from this particular village. And then they would have the gifts that would be, um, gifts would be a set aside for that number of people. They would, the runner would go to the next village and do the same thing. So as the, as the chief extended his invitations, he also knew then what he had to have prepared to feed the people, not just for a day, people would come and they could be there for a week, they could be there for two weeks, they could be on the, they could be traveling for a week at a time to get, to get there so that that leader would take everything into account. What would they need to go travel back home? What kind of food would they need to go back home? They'd send all the gifts, but they would take care of them during that time, feed them, host them. There would be storytelling, there would be sharing of events. They will, there would be ceremonies for those people to, as they came in. So the the wealth of an individual was considered by what they were able to give away. The same kind of consideration was given at the time of death, that if somebody passed away, to honor that person, but also to allow that spirit to be um, set free, everything in that household would go. It would be giving a, given away. It also then shares a little bit of the mourning. So you're, you're, you're like taking a little bit of the mourning and sharing that with the people that you give away your, your items to. And so that, that concept of a potlatch and concept of wealth was not a European, um, ideal. So when the Europeans came, and particularly when the churches came, when they saw the, the, the our people giving everything away, um, that was one of the, one of the um, ceremonies that was outlawed. It was, it was, it became against the law to continue to practice that value system where the Europeans saw value as material ownership, our people saw value in what you could give away, what you could share, how you distributed that, not only in your own, own immediate family, but to the larger community. And then also your, those values reached out far and far away, but it came back. When the one of the one of your invitees held their potlatch, they also knew well I had been to this village, and now it's my turn to reciprocate, and then that again was the the measure of of wealth was to how you gave it back. So it was reciprocal. It didn't stay idle. And the Europeans didn't understand that value system that our people relied upon. The sustainability of, of relationships to one another. I spoke of the trader. The trader would have known in each village who was the head of the village, who was his wife, how many wives did he have? Our people here. On the, on the West Coast, again, 
could have more than one wife, but you had to be able to take care of that wife and the entire family. So the trader would know the head of the village, the wife of the village, the other leaders in the village, they would know all of them. So when he came to that village, he could introduce himself and gift again to each person in that, in that village with a gift because they, that was the value of, again, another measurement of value was not, was being able to know who you are and be able to say who your parents were, grandparents, great grandparents, and as many people back because that was your tie to the community, it was your tie to the people that you were wanting to trade with. You, you knew what your relationships were, you knew what your past relationships were. And so that was how you were able to travel from village to village. If someone was sick in your, in your um, crew that was with you, they would take care of you. Not only that, then they would replenish your, help you replenish your food by trading. They would replenish what you need, but they also would trade with you for their finest baskets, ba blankets, carvings, whatever it was that the person was trading for. And so then the next, in the next village, that was like their, what's in your back? They, the, the people then in the next village knew that you were coming. They knew what you were doing. They were preparing for your arrival. And that's how traders were able to develop their enterprise. It was based upon those relationships. We had, we, we from the Piao people had, a, had and, and those of us that live right here know that our octopus are of the largest and of the largest octopus in the world. So that was one of our trade items that other people didn't have, particularly as you travel towards the east, towards east of the mountains. And it was something that people wanted. So that was a commodity that came from here that was treasured as a trade item. We have um, you know, th those stories that people really relished the octopus when, when our people came to their areas. So we developed our wealth by relationships. Our, our economy was based on those relationships. Our, our family support was based on those relationships. When our people then began to um, have contact with Europeans, the first contact in this area was with the traders. They came and they visited and one of the most impactful things that the early trade systems brought to our people here was disease. Smallpox, simple things like cold and flus, things that we had not um, ever been exposed to. Recent history at Port Angeles and the Lower Elowa people the state of Washington was uh, building, I think like a ferry dock, I forget what they were building. And they came across a village site just there in Port Angeles. And at that village site, as they, the, as they, um, I can't think of the word right now, um, but um, found, the um, evidences of the village, but they also found the evidences of the impact of the smallpox. Our people didn't um, have graves. 
our people um, were left to nature in a canoe in a tree. But there at that site, they had um, mass, mass grave sites and that you could, there's evidence of the smallpox disease um, because they were burying their people. And a lot of people were dying all at once. And so that's, that's a recent history that um, our Eloah people um, had to deal with not only the, the remnants, but also are not only the remnants, not only the artifacts, but also the remains of the people still are housed in cedar boxes. There's a like a um, fog of grief in the village there until they are will until they're able to finally return those um, remains to the earth that 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 will be settled. But when you have a village that is almost entirely wiped out, you lose portions of the expertise from your carvers, your basket makers, the storytellers. You lose that uh, opportunity to share. We taught by storytelling. We handed down information. We taught the next generation. People, our children learn by watching. When you lose those um, culture bearers, you lose them, you lose, it's like your library burning down. You lose that information. It's, it, it impacted our villages greatly with the loss of numbers. And so that was a very early impact. Many of the traders, when they came, they collected items. They collected baskets, they collected um, utensils, they watched and took a lot of notes about what, what they found, but they also took a lot of the items back to their home company. And in Europe, there's house many, many, many artifacts from the Pacific coast. When we were building our new Pyelp Tribal Health Authority in the early 1980s, um, a lot of the research that was done on the baskets because we wanted to utilize um, our old basket designs, um, we went, the. We researched from the, the libraries and museums in Europe because that's where many great collections were held. But they, those came from the early traders that came to this area. And so we have, we have in some of those, in many of our, our um, historic preservations. We go to these museums where our artifacts are housed and, and um, even just recently, my department um, did a virtual tour of Pialop artifacts at the Burt Museum. European contact then also brought with it the treaty wars or the signing of treaties that moved us from our original villages um, and to different, um, different areas where we lived. Um, at Nisqually, they were moving people to the top of a, a hillside where our people always came and went from the mouth of the river um, to the bay to fish. Our villages always were at the water, because that's where you, that's where we, we, um, those connections to our everyday life was to the water. So our longhouses were on the water. 
early European contact then changed not only where, you, where we lived, it changed how we lived. I was an adult before I ever saw a longhouse. European contact, in order to change how we lived, they destroyed and burnt down our longhouses. Like I said, I was an adult before I ever saw a longhouse. There were no long, there were no existing longhouses here at Nisqually, here at Puyallup that I would have ever seen. I probably would have never even known of because it's not what was taught in our school books. And so I was an adult before I saw that. My father was a fisherman. He had a canoe. And as a child, we helped my dad fish. And um, my dad would fish in December. And I never ever felt um, afraid uh, that we were going to tip over, never afraid that um, as my dad and, we, and us helped pull his net and bring the fish into his canoe, I never felt like we were in any danger. And, and today I look at our rivers in December, even rivers in the summertime, but I, I our rivers run real fast in the winter time. And, but I didn't ever have a sense of fear. And we spent a lot of time with my dad helping him. And so our, our people had that kind of relationship with, with the land around them. So when the Europeans put us on reservations, said this is where you can live. And I was visiting with an elder. Her family was sent from Vashon Island to Yakima when during these times of moving our people. And her husband's family was also sent to Yakima. So she met, met her husband who was Pialop. She was Pialop. She raised a full blood, she, they were both full blood Pialps. She raised her children as full blood Pialps in Yakima on the reservation over there because that's where they were sent when the reservation system was set up. So as an elder, she wanted to come home and she wanted to die in the place where her, her parents came from. And that was her wish. And she was able to come home. She brought a few members of her family home, but she still has children that live across the mountains. So this is, is was a very disruptive time. It moved us about where we lived, sent us places. The environment, the language is totally different from the East Coast to the West Coast of Washington. When they also were putting us on reservations, um, the Pyalp Indian Agency is where you see the um, Pyalp Casino right there on Portland Avenue in Tacoma. Uh, the, it, that was the first Indian agency where it was built. But that was also the largest Puyallup village because we were right on the waterway. We were right at the mouth of the river. We connected with our people upriver, but also connected with our people along Commencement Bay. The Indian agency then was a was a Department of War um, that was who built it. So our early, early supervision was by the Department of War. Our people had to live in, you know, the wooden frame houses. The Cushman Trade School was built there at the, the village site. The Cushman Trade School brought Indian children from all over the Western Washington to go to school. 
remove their children from their villages, remove their children from their homes, remove their children from their families. And this was an early, early measure of, of um, removing the culture and all ties to our culture. It also was a time where our children, our people couldn't speak their language, couldn't practice their own religion, couldn't practice their spirituality, couldn't sing their songs, and couldn't be with their families. This attempt at genocide was a very clear, but not necessarily effective way we were able to survive that time, but it was a time that was survived through a lot of trauma. There was not only the, the inability to speak our own language, but there was the punishment when you were caught and you were a child, you were punished severely. Our elders then didn't want to share that punishment with our children. So they didn't share those stories. They didn't share what happened there. They internalized all of that. And, and in my family, how it was shared was my, my parents were told being Indian is no longer going to be useful to you. And that was what was shared with my parents. So I would have never heard our language from either sets of my grandparents at Nisqually or my grandparents at um, Chehalis. I would have never heard those stories that connected you to um, connected you to our creation stories, connected us to those stories that taught us how to live, the values. I didn't hear those things from my grandparents, but my grandparents said an education is important. And that was, I had both my parents were high school educated, high school graduates, there still is a leg legacy of the McLeod brothers in the Yellum community because of their, their um, ability as athletes. They took Yellum High School to the state every year that there was a McLeod boy still in high school. My mother was a very um, bright person. She graduated from high school in Oakville. I have 10 minutes left and I'm, I um, just want to um, very quickly then make just a few more um, comments about some things that were um, important. Uh, following the Cushman um, trade school where our children were, were removed uh, from their their villages and their families. Then came the Cushman, trade, uh, Cushman Hospital in the early 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Tuberculosis was a epidemic in many communities. The Cushman Hospital was uh, built to be, and those with tuberculosis, tuberculosis were sent to the hospital there. Tuberculosis then was also not a treatable disease at that time. So many of our people were experimented on. Many of our people died there at Cushman. Our people were sent to the Cushman Hospital from as far east as North and South Dakota. They came here from Alaska. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, and many of them never went home because of the disease. Others didn't go home because they were too far away and they were no longer connected to their families. Our people 
lived through boarding school area. We've lived through epidemics of early contact. We've lived through epidemics of tuberculosis. We have then come to a time today of healing. When I came to work for the Puyallup Tribal Health Authority, I said that I was involved with a demographic survey, collected numbers about um, education status, housing, health care, and began to develop a, a sound basis for the tribe to begin um, writing grants and getting um, uh, assistance to build a school, to build homes. In the 1980s, we had a very small land base. We had, didn't have how tribal housing. Our people live all throughout Pierce County. And so that was one of the first things the tribe was able to do was to begin getting some housing for our people. We began to have a clinic. I worked in the basement of our church at the Presbyterian Church. And we did um, uh, worked with the county to have well child clinics, women's health care um, with the county and eventually was able to begin and build our own clinic. Our very first clinic was a trailer in the uh, in the cemetery property that the tribe had. And today we have a beautiful clinic facility at the Puyallup Tribal Health Authority. Today we have a school that provides education, the Chief Leshai School for our children that is safe, a place where our people can learn. But it is also a place where we're teaching culture our language and providing safe opportunities for our children to come together. And just this last week, because of the pandemic, our children are actually back in the classroom. In 1978, the tribe began negotiating um, Indian land claim settlement that helped um, bring several opportunities for the Puyallup tribe to, because the tribe had so many areas of land in dispute over ownership and because many large companies had land that was in, still in ownership dispute that was one of the things that was the object of the land claim settlement, but it also brought us education money. It brought us land. It brought us um, um, economic development. The tribe was able to build their marina and today it, the I was talking to with one of my workers and our marina is, um, I, I guess I, is full. There's no more capacity to um, uh, um, come house your boats because they've, they've grown to capacity. We have private enterprise. We have enterprise that the tribe has developed and um, Today, we are the third largest employer in Pierce County. Our, our people had the opportunity to go to school. That was a part of the land claim settlement where if you wanted to go to school, regardless of your age, you can have some, we have financial support for our, our community to go to school. There are many things that the tribe is involved in as taking care of the Puyallup tribal membership, but also our charity 
the taxes that come from our our casinos get back to the community. And um, we are um, a good neighbor. We help look out for all of our people that live here. Today, we have issues that not only protect our salmon and our treaty rights to fish, to gather, um, to hunt, but also to protect our waterways, to protect our water, because when we protect our water, we protect the water for everybody. So we have many, many um, areas that the tribe oversees for to continue to protect our, our treaty rights, but it also allows us to help protect and um, continue the, the um, quality of life for all people in our, in our community. I see that we just have um, a few minutes left. I, um, wanted to um, just give you a chance to ask any questions, um, but I'm... I'll jump in here really quick, Connie. It's such a privilege yes. to have you come here and share with us. And I think we will continue if people have some questions to ask a few. I know people can head off as they as they need to, but there's definitely time to be able to, to continue to talk a little bit. And okay. so I encourage others to ask, because again, it is such a privilege to have you here and a, and a wealth of history to share with us uh, about the Puyallup and other tribes of the area. And I know that's something that people here are, are very open to hearing and, and trying to learn from. So I'll open that up for questions. I know one really quick one for me is regarding the Puyallup Canoe family that I know that you shared a little bit with me. If you'd like to share a little bit about that and the involvement of that and the reasons for the that uh, canoe family. Yes, I. that's a, that's a, real important um, connection that I have. Uh, we would have uh, taken our canoes out this morning and had a canoe awakening ceremony because our canoes have been um, in storage over the winter. And unfortunately, last week, we had somebody come and clean our building that had COVID and it um, shut our building down until uh, the cleaners could come in and do a deep cleaning into our building. So we have to wait two weeks for that ceremony. But our about 25 years ago, we began to um, work with the Northern Canoe people, Northern, uh, one of the communities, uh, they began to call and talk to us. And I kept missing a couple of the calls. And finally, when I got back to them, they were interested in selling a canoe to us. In 20, or in 19, oh, I'm a little bit confused but with an, um, Bella Bella was one of the first uh, communities to host a canoe gathering. And many people from the West Coast traveled there to Bella Bella. And um, it began a, an awareness of the canoe culture. In uh, what followed the paddle to Bella Bella was um, a canoe journey that started here in, uh, on the West Coast and came into Seattle for the bicentennial celebration. The um, office of superintendent, Emmett Oliver, was the Indian liaison. And he was able to get a couple of trees from the Forest Service and built some of the first canoes, again, reemerging in the Puget Sound along the West Coast. And from those gatherings then came an annual event 
of gathering and traveling by canoe. So our people talked with um, the people at South. They built us a canoe. And in 1998, we were able to come home with a canoe, have our first hosting with 20 canoes. Um, and we have built a canoe program that's built as a drug and alcohol prevention. Our people are drug and alcohol free. We are one of the canoes that are tobacco free and we're violence free. We use our traditional color, co tradition and culture of talking circles to problem solve, to help plan, to do things as, an, an, as a group. And due to COVID last year and this year, the annual canoe journeys um, have been, um, are not happening. But in 1998, we hosted over 100 canoes that came here um, to the Pialp tribe. We hosted them for nine days of potlatching. We fed them uh, two meals a day. And the final five days, we ran our potlatches 24 hours a day so that everybody that we invited would have an opportunity to come and share their culture, to sing and dance. We worked for several years ahead of that time within our community, um, teaching our songs, teaching our dances, teaching our regalia, teaching how to weave, teaching our people about the importance of this kind of gathering. And we did a good job. We were able to um, host um, well over 5,000 people during that time. And so the canoe journeys are, are um, a way for us to teach our culture. When you paddle on a canoe, you have to work together. There are many lessons and teachings about being um, on the water. We never enter our canoe being angry. We teach that you leave all of those kinds of feelings on land. Because when you work together, you it's easier to travel. And we have traveled hundreds of miles along our waterway. We have, we have gone to Bella Bella. It took us nearly three weeks to get there, and we were in Bella Bella for a week, so we were gone for well over a month. And we have been to the Pacific Coast twice to Quinault. One of the times our canoe hit bad weather out on the ocean. It was one of our early, um, early um, years in doing canal in doing canoe journeys and we were not very well prepared. We did not have good communications on our, on our support boat or on the canoe. We had gotten out on, the, out on the ocean and got fogged in. We had brought with us uh, an elder from Quinault who was a fisherman so that they would help us know, um, you know the area. They, had, they fished out on the Pacific Ocean but having a fog, uh, the fog come in, we could not see the coastline. We could hear when we got close to the coastline because you could hear the surf, but you couldn't identify where we were. And we were out that day and it was getting late. It was getting to be five o'clock. And uh, we um, talked with our support boat, which was just a little skiff. We had um, our canoe with um, a full crew, which was eight people. And we decided to um, go to land. And um, fortunately, uh, we came out near Claylock, but our, our skipper before we got to land says, told us, hang on, here comes a wave. And like you see on TV, there was a wave that came up and over us and um, we filled with water. 
our skipper, who was a woman, by the way, um, said, here's a second one. And that, uh, that wave came over us and it rolled us. And so the teachings of the canoe are that you stay with the canoe. You don't leave the canoe. The canoe will take care of you. Um, and that's what it did. It, we, we were able to uh, all stay um, together. We, the canoe came in, fortunately, at Claylock. Our skip, our little um, uh, support canoe had gone into land. There were people on the beach that helped us come in. Um, our canoe came in undamaged. We were able to retrieve everything but our lunchbox and all of our paddles. Our people came in with minor injuries. Um, I was probably the most impacted with, um, uh, I was very cold, yeah. hypothermia. And because we were at Claylock, all of our people that were soaking wet and cold could go in. They brought us in and, and warmed us up in a in a um, one of their cabins. People just opened up um, opened up their cabins for us. Um, only one person went to the hospital to be checked out, and she was okay. But she needed to be um, needed to be checked out. We were not the only ones that this had happened to. There were two other, uh, one other canoe that had gone over, turned over. They were a little bit closer to shore. Um, others were still coming in at Quinault in the dark. That was probably one of the most. Um, and then Paul's stories to share about our canoe journeys are usually not that kind of excitement. Usually we have a lot of fun. We're out on the water. We sing and dance and share, but um, that, was, uh, that was an eventful time. The canoe journeys then have um, give us identity. Uh, it says that Today, when we started with no songs, um, some of the teachers in our school were from uh, Alaska. So the songs that our children learned were Alaskan songs. Our paddle songs were Alaskan. And so today we have our own songs that come from our people. And we have um, learned how to make our own regalia. And like I said, we are able to do things like gather cedar and make cedar outfits. We do wool weaving um, as part of the, that. We, with COVID, we've been able to do um, Zoom uh, teachings. And um, many times when we're preparing for our classes, we're sending um, kits so if we, uh, Christmas time, we were making baskets and headbands, we would prepare 200, 250 at a time to get ready to mail out um, to people. And we teach the classes over Zoom. So we've been able to reach more people than if we had had a class for 30, 35 every week. We've reached people in uh, Florida, Georgia, New York, um, North and South Dakota, New Mexico, Montana, Alaska. And so we, we continue to um, teach our, our classes over the Zoom. And it was, uh, we've actually been able to reach more people. Uh, sometimes our uh, open area is what would have been, we're in a house for offices. So it would have been the living room. Our living room looks like Santa's workshop sometimes because of uh, the amount of work it takes to prepare um, these kits and get them sent out um, to the community. Um, so that, you know, we continue to um, uh, operate. We are also a essential uh, services. We have provided traditional medicines and we've gathered um, 
our plants and medicines and, and um, one of the first ones we sent um, a traditional medicine um, care package to um, 135 of our elders and um, we continue to gather and disperse the traditional medicine as requested um, to our people. And that was a shift we were able to make because of COVID. So some of our activities, um, we were able to prioritize and say, this is something that we're going to do um, within our community. Um, last year actually was the very first time that we had gathered camas and um, gathered it in the amounts so that we could serve it with our, um, our traditional foods um, feast at our, first, um, at our first fish ceremony that we will have in um, the 22nd of May, but usually we have our first fish ceremony in May. But for the first time we included camas in that, in that meal so that was a part of our growth also was to be able to um, for the first time do that. Um, so we now are preparing, like I said early on, I'm watching for those camas blooms. Um, one of our fisheries harvest managers sent me um, flowers of camas that are blooming in the squally on the prairie there. So Hopefully in this next week, the flowers in this area will begin to bloom and we can gather camas and um, get ready for our first fish ceremony here on the 22nd of May. You talked about going to art school and I see that uh, piece behind you. Do you can you share the, the meaning of, uh, of that blue and white? Um, uh, art piece behind you? Yes, that is um, uh, our blanket that one of our Pialp tribal uh, artists uh, developed uh, or had uh, allowed us to use his um, painting as a logo. So that's the logo for the Pialp tribal, um, Pialp canoe family. And I'll move over a little bit so you can see a little bit more of the whole picture. Um, so in 1998, when we hosted um, the annual canoe journey, this artist says, let me um, make a few changes. I'm a different artist today, 20 years later. And so this was the, this is actually a wool blanket um, it was uh, uh, ordered through or made through um, a Native American organization called Eighth Generation. He makes wool blankets. Pendleton uh, uh, used to make um, uh, or does still make the Native American design blankets, but this is a Native owned um, business. And so we, this is the logo for the Pialp uh, Canoe family. We gave away these blankets to each of the um, uh, visiting uh, canoes and, um, um, and chiefs that came. And then today, this is the blanket that the tribe uses for their gifting. Uh, but it, it tells the story of the Thunderbird and um, And uh, our, it represents the, the Thunderbird, um, our sacred mountain, which uh, another time we could talk about the renaming of Mount Tacoma, um, and then our, our canoe in the water. And so this design was developed by uh, Sean Peterson, who's a PL tribal member. And this is the logo that we have used for our canoe family. Beautiful. Some other questions?
I know we often as uh, white communities, particularly like to think of what kind of allyship or what what could be some kind of a response that would would be good for for us to to be a part of uh, your tribal system what, what if you if there was something that you could ask of us what would that be well the one thing that the, the BLM tribe is working on is um, the LNG plant on the Port of Tacoma um, not only is uh, uh. that a risk for the PL community <clears throat> and our waters, all of our natural resources. If we were to have an accident there, um, it would destroy the port. Um, it would impact our waters. It would impact many, many people. Um, like I said, our people don't live in, in just one area. Our people are your neighbors. Our people are your next door neighbors. And when we talk about the natural resources such as the salmon. Our people are, have taught that if our natural resources are gone, if our culture is gone, if our salmon is gone, it not only impacts, impacts us, it impacts all of our neighbors. It means that there's been a very significant change in our environment. And today the, our, envi our, our environmental impact one of the, the greatest challenges too is also the climate change. Um, the climate change has impacted our fisheries because our waters are warmer. Yeah. So our fish um, are not surviving as well in the warm waters. So we have areas in the Puget Sound that are dead waters. Nothing grows there. There are areas on our in our Puget Sound that have been so highly um, polluted and the, the chemicals that are in the ground, there is no way to um, mitigate their impact. So the only way to um, deal with them is you leave it in the ground. So like when we were getting ready for the canoe journey, we built a, um, a small dock and a landing area on uh, Marine View Drive, just close to our Chinook Landing Marina. And, and so some of the ecological questions we had to go through would be, would our people wear shoes? They didn't want anybody in the water in bare feet. They didn't want people disturbing the mud. Um, we had to set out areas where they had um, mitigated um, with some vegetation. And um, uh, we had to know what was in that, uh, what was in that land uh, or shoreline. And so we eventually got clearance to be able to bring our people in there, but we still, there are still areas in our, our homelands, all of our homelands where um, you don't dig, you don't disturb because the chemicals that are in those um, uh, shoreline areas, they can't, you, they can't get rid of them. There's no way to um, mitigate it. And so the best idea is to leave it there. And those, the pollution that's dumped and the, the things that are dumped in, um, you know, in the river, they don't stay in the river. They come into the commencement bay. They eventually wash out all over. Um, Many of the um, people on Bashan Island will, will share with us what they collect that really does come from downriver on the Pialp River. That's part of the pollution that, that affects everyone. So those, those are the kind of issues of, 
uh, uh, that our tribe is dealing with today. Um, I, I got a phone call to talk to the manager from the Electron Hydro Dam several months ago. One of their contractors laid out um, artificial turf for some reason I don't quite understand yet. And when he put out the artificial turf um, upriver in the Pelt River up by um, Electron, it disintegrated. Oh, no. And so all went the green astroturf, the, the rubber um, pellets, what became pellets, now oh. are lined the entire Pialp River. We did an Earth Day cleanup on, um, around the commencement bay uh, just last week. And so some of the things we were looking for was that green carpet, but that green carpet is has washed all the way out to the, uh, the Pialp River, but it impacts our salmon and impacts our um, growth and um, of the salmon. And it's it just shows how um, without a little education or, or um, how a small act can be as devastating as that to, then it is not only to the fish, but it's to the pollution in the water. Um, these elements do not disintegrate um, completely. And, uh, um, and then one of the, the largest things that we cleaned up on, long, on the water shore last week was picking up of styrofoam. And, uh, you know, that is also a substance that doesn't disintegrate and stays on our waterways. And um, so, you know, those are things that impact everybody. It, it isn't something that stays in our home. If we wanted to come help with some of those cleanups, how would we know about them that are being hosted? <clears throat> um, Citizens for uh, the Healthy Bay is one area that um, the tribe works with uh, pretty closely. I know there's a, an excellent documentary out there on the LNG um, put on, hosted by Puyallup tribal people. I forgot the name right now. Um, yeah. Talking about the, the history and where it stands right now in court process. So. I've kind of taken over on the questioning. Does somebody else have something to ask? Uh, this is Carolyn Kampleskowski. Um, I want to uh, honor you for your story, Connie, and share how deep, deeply grateful I am for it. Um, my great-great-grandmother was Ann Canham. Her daughter was Lucy A. Paddle Dance. And, um, and my grandfather, my father. Um, and I am a member of the Yakima Nation. And uh, that displacement grief that is so prevalent among our people, um, and uh, and being mixed blood, I find I have a foot in two cultures, and they are so different and so uh, opposing to to life on Earth. I really uh, prefer living with nature. And so I honor you and thank you very much. Thank you. The, yes, Pial tribe, the, 
the Peel Tribe just opened um, 25 tiny homes for our homeless Peel Tribal members. And um, when we talk about healing, um, the present issue of homelessness, we have to go back and look at that generational um, trauma that not only are we healing the impacts of today's um, drug and alcohol use, but also those, all of the grief and loss from multi-generations, um, particularly because one way of protection was to be quiet. So when you're quiet, you internalize that pain and you don't heal it. And our people also understand that it's passed down from generation to generation. And so along with the internalized pain, that internalized um, healing and wellness is also um, taught that our ancestors are praying for us. Our ancestors are helping to heal us. And then as we're able to touch the ground, whether you're gardening, whether you walk out your back porch and you, you stand on your own lawn in your, in your bare feet, you still are connecting with the earth. You're connecting with the water. I walk, I go to our water many, many times. Um, I love it on the water when our canoes are out. We're real anxious um, to get our canoes on the water. Um, and I just, uh, you know, thankful for um, a lot of the support that our people have gotten. Um, to understand that um, the responsibility to care for this Mother Earth belongs to all, all of us. I too was, in, was fortunate that Billy Frank Jr. was my uncle. He had been married to my aunt, my father's sister. And um, Uncle Billy was Uncle Billy to everybody. But he also was a um, very, very effective and large voice for the environment, not only for the Native people, but for everybody, because it is everybody's responsibility to take care of um, our resources that we have. Because once they're gone, they're gone. There's no other way. Um, to come back. You are definitely tied to a lot of history, Connie. <laughs> That's very important. Con Connie, thank you again for, for coming and talking to us. I know it's probably very intimidating to <laughs> <laughs> to talk to a bunch of little square faces on a screen, <laughs> but you've certainly given us a lot of food for thought and expanded our knowledge. So I really appreciate you coming. Thank and you. Being when, yeah. Thank you. Sometimes when I'm speaking, I, 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 I want to get to everything and I know that I can't get to everything. And so sometimes I'll talk real fast uh, or what I'll do also is I'll get through mid sentence and I'll drop the sentence because I'm, I'm, I have some other things in my head that I'm trying to get to. But generally I try to organize my thoughts a little bit and, and, not, and I try not to, um, I try to complete a sentence and, and be aware of uh, not skipping out too much. You did excellent, Connie. All right, thank you.
how do you pronounce in the in the Puyallup in the, your tribal language the name of your tribe? Spialapops. Spialapops. Yeah. Hmm. And again, what does that mean? Generous people. It's one oh. of the meetings, but it the literal meaning is the place of the bend of the river. Hmm. Seems to me it's the Puyallup tribe that's also very influential in this renaming to uh, uh, Mount Tacoma, Mount Tacoma, or however. Uh, no, but, uh, yeah, there are several pronunciations depending upon the meeting and also depending upon what, what part of the, the mountain faces you. And, but yes, that it's an important, because in that history, Rainier never was even step foot on, on North America. Rainier was a, a friend of one of the, uh, commanders of uh, the ships that came into this area, the early explorers, and he named the mountain Rainier after his friend, but his friend had never ever been here. So he has no, no, there's no real tie to our people, but um, there's, this is also not a precedent, um, Mount Denali, in Alaska that was renamed and our many of our individual sites that um, negatively depict our people like Squaw Mountain, um, those things like that have been changed. But, but that's also the changing of the, the name of the mountain also will take a, um, a large movement of people, public comment, um, to support that. Did the Puyallup tribe make excursions up towards the mountain at all? No, we haven't. Um, we haven't done like the gotten into the tourism. The, um, the closest thing would be um, we've uh, invited people to um, join us uh, with a canoe family. So we've gone, we've traveled with um, various people from our community. They're not Yelp tribal members that are not native, but are interested in what we're doing. So that would be the, our closest. We had several years ago um, joined with the city of Tacoma and we traveled with them to Fuzhou, China um, as part of their dragon boat racing team. And um, we, we um, took several members from the Pialp tribe canoe family with them then. Um, but that's probably the closest to any your um, um, tourism kind of activities that we've done. I'm thinking even in, 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 in older times, where did people ever go up nearer to the mountain or stay pretty much the Puyallup tribe locally to the waters? Oh, no, no, it, we had people clear up to the um, uh, mountain. Our water comes from the mountain, so we would have had people all along the villages of the, the waterway. And so our our um, fishing and hunting rights go from the um, sound to the mountain because those are areas where we not only live, but where we gathered and hunted. Well, I think we'll go ahead and uh, conclude for today, but Connie again, so uh, I'm pleased that you could come and honored to have you share with us 
And thank you all that uh, were, were here. Next week, I'm going to show some videos of different people across the country who at least families had been involved in boarding schools and how that affected and has continues to affect their, their lives. So it'll be from voices of different people. Um, so that's what we'll be sharing next week. And if you want to stay on for a minute, I'll chat with you just for a little bit, ask a okay. couple more questions. And thank you again also for the invitation. Yes, very. I'm so pleased you answered the email. <laughs> thank you, Connie. Yeah. You're welcome. <clears throat>